Hello everybody, welcome to the first in a long-running series where I will be going through new magic cards and their implications for commander, cube, and casual formats. These are the formats that I think let people express themselves the most, so I want to express some of my opinions to you. I'm not going to be going through every single card, but I'm going to be giving the highlights on the ones that I think will be most impactful and the ones that I think are most interesting in general to talk about. And to lead that off, we're going to be talking about a little black uncommon acquisition expert. Now, Acquisition Expert, when it enters the battlefield, target opponent reveals a number of cards from their hand equal to the number of creatures in your party. Party is a new mechanic that they're introducing where they're collecting certain D&D-esque uh, classes and making you care about those. So a party can consist of a cleric, a rogue, a warrior, and a wizard. So that's up to four cards revealed when Acquisition Expert enters a battlefield. And then what do you do with those cards? Well, you choose one of them and that player discards that card. You may be thinking to yourself, why is this noteworthy? We have plenty of cards that when they enter the battlefield, your opponent discards a card. And what I think is particularly powerful about Acquisitions Expert is that it doesn't say non-land, and it gives you the selection. So at its face value, it's a... 1-2 Rogue, which is important, we're getting more Rogue support, wonderful, wonderful as always, and when there's the battlefield, at the very least, your opponent's going to discard one card. When the very most, they're going to reveal close to their whole hand, and you get to choose any card from it. This gives us unprecedented selection from any cards that really come before it, where your opponent has the entire choice. Yes, they get to choose which cards they reveal, but the ability to mana screw your opponent, to take a key card, and to blink and flicker and reanimate the acquisitions expert to your heart's content, I think gives it a lot of power. And I think we'll allow it to see play in tribal decks as well as value decks. Next up, we have a cycle of lands. I'm just going to be showing two of them, but they have a very powerful ability where you get to choose which side they enter the battlefield. I'm showing two cards, but they're really one card, both sides of the same coin, if you will. We have a Boulder Loft Pathway on the back side and Branch Loft Pathway on the front side. Now, these lands are importantly missing the basic land types, which admittedly would have made them much stronger and much more interesting, if I'm honest. However, if we're not to give them the basic land types, at least they come into play untapped. This makes them almost strict upgrades to basic lands. If you are a two color or more deck, you should be running these in your deck. Yes, they don't have the same versatility as dual lands. However, they are going to give you the colors you need when you need them. And being untapped gives you the power to play them off the top of your library if you need more mana. You don't have to worry about sequencing. You can play your tap lands out first. They're just incredibly powerful. Although they're not as versatile as some other lands that we have coming up, I think these ones are easily going to be going for 10 15 maybe even $20. Although that kind of takes them out of the realm of some casual, for cube and commander, these are must-haves and must-plays for any deck and of any color combination. Next, we have a much-wanted kind of card, Farsight Adept. A 3-3 for two generic and one white. This core wizard has an ability that people have been dreaming of for white cards and commanders everywhere. And that is when it enters the battlefield, you and target opponent each draw a card. Powerful, strong, beefy body, and... What I like about this one is that it plays very well into the casual sphere of politics. It doesn't work in Too High Giant, which is unfortunate, or it does, but you can't make your teammate draw a card. If it was you and another target player draw a card, that would be, well, oh, icing on the cake. Phenomenal, powerful card. However, the fact that 
it's only one opponent and not each opponent makes this card come out more of a card neutral. And if you and another opponent are trying to fight against the arch enemy on the table, not the literal arch enemy in an arch enemy game, in which case you have to make the arch enemy draw, but a arch enemy in the sense that they're dominating the, t the play, then this guy is going to help you and them catch up. It's kind of like Skullwinder in that regard. Not as powerful in that drawing a random card is weaker than drawing a specific card, and a 3-3 is weaker than a 1-3 with death touch. However, this guy does offer some serious value in much more casual tables, in less competitive settings, and the ability to blink him as well and draw extra value, get things, as well as it's a forced draw, it's not a may. So, on the rare circumstance that your opponent is trying to deck themselves, you can sneak in here with your little core and kill them when they're trying to go for the win say, with a Thassa's Oracle trigger on the stack. Then we have Limvala, Shield of Seagate. A far cry from the Limvala of past, where she before would make it so that monocolored players just could not play the game, and that many decks of two, three, and even four colors were severely hampered in their game plan. This Limvala is more of a uh, constructed creature, although she is legendary, so she can be your commander. So if you're trying to play Angel Tribal, maybe she's the low-to-the-ground flying beatdown that you want, although I kind of doubt it. She has, at the beginning of combat on your turn, if you have a full party, so that's again, if your party consists of of a cleric, a rogue, a warrior, and a wizard, and she is a wizard, so you just need three other people. You can choose target non-land permanent and opponent controls until your next turn. It can't attack, block, and its activate abilities can't be activated. So basically, she detains a non-land permanent your opponent controls, and then you can sacrifice her and choose one, either indestructibility or hexproof, and then it, uh, creatures you control gain that ability. So she has some seriously strong wrath and targeted removal protection. I could imagine it trying to fly her into a uh, opponent and giving all of your creatures hexproof could be very strong or protecting again kind of like a teferi's protection from the command zone which we all know how powerful teferi's protection is so an incredibly versatile spell especially again in that command zone giving her sacrifice ability making it sure that even in the face of a wrath or target of removal she's not completely useless and then it giving you some uh, uh, individual removal, getting rid of powerful artifacts, enchantments, and uh, creatures from your commander. She seems like a decent stacks piece, maybe not the best stacks general, but if you open her up, she can be the gateway that you need. Next up, we have a much needed reprint in Lotus Cobra. Lotus Cobra is a very powerful card. It turns basically any fetch land into a black lotus, which is insane. And seeing as fetch lands are not going to be in Zendikar proper, they're going to be in a expedition uh, sort of situation, uh, they've downshifted it from mythic rare all the way to rare. So this means that it's going to be in the hands of players, it's going to be used more, and you're going to see more Lotus Cobras in the field. Even in Evolving Wilds, turning into a very powerful source of uh, instant mana burst, giving you two additional mana that turn, can make Lotus Cobra quite potent. And if you haven't played with it in a landfall deck, and you don't know its explosive power, I would suggest testing it out, especially because we're in Zendikar, and landfall is going to be a major theme as seen on our next card, Omanoth, Locust of Creation. First he was a jelly bean, then he became an angry jelly bean, then he was wet, and now he's infused with the power of white mana to give you that much needed life gain. The previous Omanoth, Omanoth Locust of the Royal, is a powerhouse in Commander, especially in Landfall decks. And although I don't think that this Omanoth is going to take that seat from him, I think if you're going to play four-color Commander, and you don't want to use uh, com 
not companions, if you don't want to use partners, Omnath Locust of Creation gives you that much needed uh, white teamer or, uh, I don't know, blue Naya or however you want to say it, uh, red, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, so Omnath, he is a 4-4-4-4, four, 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 one of each of the non-black colors. And when he enters the battlefield, you draw a card. So recoup your value, pretty easy. And then when a land enters the battlefield, he has a very special landfall trigger. For the uh, whenever it enters the battlefield, you gain four life. So you're going to be a very high life total with this deck. And then when it's the second time it happens, you add one of each of the non-black colors. So your second land becomes a super uh, black lotus, just exploding with mana, which is awesome, turning any of the fetches very powerful. And then the third one, which is going to happen less, but it's kind of a wrath for your opponent's planeswalkers. So if you're in a planeswalker heavy meta, Omnath Locus of Creation may be the general for you. I think it fits really good in the 99 of a five color elemental deck. I also think if you again if you want to go for colors omnath may be the best way to do it he's not generically powerful but even if you're just running a couple of fetch lands getting that burst of mana is going to be insane and having your life total padded out is very helpful in a very dirtily kind of four color deck next up we have another tribal commander in the form of aura skyclave heliopath and what this guy does is whenever he or another cleric dies, you get to resurrect a creature with a cleric creature with a lesser converted mana cost. So what this guy is really just begging for is the value plan of clerics. Now clerics are starting to be sold out of some of their payoffs. I know Edge Walker is up to $12 right now because people are buying it out because cleric tribal is apparently going to be a thing here and Edge Walker's CMC uh, mana cost reduction is paramount to make the deck great. However, this guy does a good job of catching you up if you fell fallen behind and there might even be some weird reanimation infinite combos in there because he resurrects them to the battlefield. Now the fact that he does CMC less means that it's going to be a little bit difficult to make that work. However, if you use clones in the appropriate way, there might be a way to mix it around as well as the, art, the enchantment conspiracy, turning all of your creatures into clerics so you're able to resurrect and bring back creatures that aren't clerics, or sorry, you can bring back clerics with non-clerics. And it, that could be potentially powerful if you have a reanimation on death trigger or something like that. Then we get to what I think are going to be the most powerful cards in the set for casual cube and commander, especially cube and commander. We have these lands that are spells, but also lands. Uh, Palaka Predation and Palaka Caverns are a very powerful, and I think they showcase just how strong this effect can be. So, it's a mediocre-ish spell on the front side. Two in a black target opponent reveals their hand, and you choose a card from it with converted mana cost three or greater. That c player discards that card. So, unlike the card earlier, we're not able to screw our opponent's mana over, but we are able to take out their finishers, which I think is very strong. Maybe even stronger in some cases. And then, if you are a little earlier on in the game, or if you are a little light on mana, you can play it as a essentially worse than swamp. It enters the battlefield tap and taps to add black. Again, in incredibly powerful because early on in the game you can play this as a tapped land, and later on in the game you can play this as a spell. I don't know, I'll have to do some playtesting, but I almost want to say that this can take the place of land slots in your deck. Kind of, it's just so incredible to have this versatility. On turn 15, 
you don't want to be drawing your land. Yes, Palaka Predation isn't the most impactful spell, but it's stronger than a land. On turn one and two, sometimes you just want to hit your land drops. Yes, you have things to do on those turns, but if you don't, you're going to be thankful that you have the caverns in your deck. I think that this is going to help your games run smoother and your decks be more powerful without depleting your wallet. I also think they lead to very interesting cube play because you're able to make your decks more consistent, because you're able to make them better. It's essentially cycling on the land, except you always know what spell you're drawing. It's beautiful. I love it. 10 out of 10. We'll do again. And uh, we'll talk about a more powerful version in a little bit. The last legendary creature that I wanted to talk about today is Tizuri, a uh, beacon of unity, a five color general, which generally I'm not a huge fan of what they're doing with five color generals. Golos, I think, is the most egregious of it, just generically good. But General Tizuri, or Beacon of Unity, I should say this time, she's been changed around. I think she uh, is powerful but in all the right ways so it costs four generic and one white for a four six and it costs one less to cast for each creature in your party again those four creature types and then it has uh, a recurring ability from Shadowmoor way back there have only ever been I think uh, five regular cards and one additional card the Reaper King with these mana symbols on it it's two generic or one colored mana and boy howdy I love this because it makes consistency mana bases fixing oh it's so good so it's either eight or the minimum cost of one of non-white one of each of those so blue black red and green and then it has look at the top six cards of your library you may reveal up to two cleric, rogue, warrior, wizard, and or ally creature cards from among them. Not even creature cards, sorry, cards. So tribal cards work, which is beautiful, from among them, and put them into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. And I love this. It's strong, but it puts them into your hand, so it's not ridiculous. It's a good source of card advantage. Sees going to cost anywhere from five to uh, one mana and that helps reduce some of the commander tax. I think she encourages you to build a five color deck that's not necessarily the strongest but if you build around it a little bit drawing two cards a turn for four mana is very strong especially if they're like your tribal cards your payoff cards. I think it's just ah, I love her, and I think she's going to make good five-color decks. Last but not least, by any degree, we have Valakut Awakening, and this goes back to the flip lands, and if the uncommon was strong, I think this is ridiculous, if I'm honest. I don't think it's too powerful, by any degree, but I think it just really shows how, how versatile these can be. So, it's Two in a red for a instant, which, whoa, so strong. Put any number of cards from your hand on the bottom of your library, then that draw that many plus one. And then on the flip side, it's a mountain, basically, that enters the battlefield tapped. So, again, just having this in your opening hand with, like, one or two other lands frees you to so many possibilities. You can draw, and you can see what you're getting. You can play this out on turn one and know that you're going to hit your land drops. You can draw this late game and shuffle away your hand and get a new hand. It's like a personal, uh, not Wheel of Fortune exactly, it's like a personal windfall that doesn't bring you down any cards. It's so powerful the versatility and the strengths of this card. I think this is close to an auto-include in any casual deck. I think this is close to an auto-include, if there is such a thing, in any uh, red commander deck that's not seeking to win the game on turn two. And I think that these spells 
are just going to make you so happy. You replace one of your mountains with one of these, and you're going to see the dividends. You're going to be paid this value, and you're going to thank me and thank yourself for including these in your deck. My only hope is that they're not too expensive, because if they are, that's a real shame, is I'm going to need tons and tons and tons and tons of these. Expect them to be more prevalent than Solemn Simulacrum. That's a hot take, but that's my take. Thank you all so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you talk about it in the comments down below, because I think that discussion is the lifeblood of this game. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.